I believe that it's imperative, like it's vital that the U.S. funds the arts because Mm -hmm. we are creative people. And in order for us to go the distance, um, you have to let people imagine what's possible. Mm. Hello, print friends, and welcome to the 20th episode of Pine Copper Lime, the internet's number one printmaking podcast. I'm your host, Miranda Metcalf. I release an episode every two weeks, and on the off weeks, I publish an article on the Pine Copper Lime website, which features images and maybe a bit more information about the artist I'm going to interview. Episode 20. It kind of feels like we just got started on this journey together last week. Watching the Pine Copper Lime community grow has been one of the most rewarding things I've ever experienced. Over the past 10 months, I've gotten messages from all over the world with people saying that this little podcast, produced in a spare bedroom in Sydney, makes them feel more connected to the broader printmaking community. It's been incredible. I got a message from a 16-year-old printmaker in India the other day who listens to the pod. And I'm not gonna lie, I might have cried a little bit. I mean, it was like a single manly tear, but it it was a tear. All right, for those of you who have not heard the big news, Pine Copper Lime is coming to SGCI 2020 in beautiful San Juan, Puerto Rico, and your friend Miranda is going to be hosting a live taping of the podcast during an official conference event. So stay tuned for more details, but I hope to see all of your beautiful faces there. Printmaking forever, shun the non-believers. Join the party. And all of this, not one bit of it, could be possible without the support of our listeners through Patreon and the Pine Copper Line Print Gallery. So thank you all so very, very much who have already contributed your hard-earned dollars or peso or bot to keeping Pine Copper Lime in our earbuds. And if you were support curious, there are links in the show notes to both. I could not think of a better way to enter PCL's Roaring Twenties than with my guest this week, Tanikia Ward. She is a Milwaukee-based visual artist, printmaker, and educator whose work centers around Black geographies. Exploring Afrofuturism, Black aesthetics, Black hair, Black identity, and Black womanhood. Tanikia is also the founder of Black Women of Print, a society where Black female printmakers can share space, intergenerational knowledge, stories, and community. If that wasn't enough, Black Women of Print is also an educational resource for discovering historical Black female printmakers currently overlooked in the printmaking camp. Tanikia brings her years of experience in art institutions and the academic arts world to our conversation. It was a true joy to host her. I know you're going to love it, so sit back, relax, and prepare to learn more than a thing or two with Tanikia Ward. Hi, Tanikia. How's it going? It's going well, just a Monday over here. (laughs) That's right. I know. Thank you so much for joining me. Yes, thanks for having me. I was very excited when you said that you were from Australia. Well, <laughs> podcast was in Australia. I said, oh, that's awesome. I've always wanted to visit Australia. But, yeah. you know, I'm kind of visiting right now. But. Totally, totally. That's that's a real Australian plant in the background there. Uh, well, and, you know, I'm here through at least 2020. You're very welcome. You'll always have a host in Australia as long as we're here. Yes. Well, I'm going to have to do that. <laughs> yeah. I was first, first introduced to you and your work uh, through Pressing Matters magazine. Mm-hmm. You wrote an article for them and then you were and then your project and you were also featured in it, I think, in not the most recent one, but the one before last. And it was just all like really exciting, great stuff. And then I heard you on the Studio Noise podcast, which is great. So yeah. I will I'll put a link to that in the show notes for this because that is is a really wonderful chat as well. But for those who don't know you yet and don't know your work, would you like to introduce yourself and answer the questions, who you are, where you are, what you do? Okay. I'm Tanikia Ward. I just finished up my coursework for a doctoral in urban education with a specialization in art education. So I'm in the research phase, which will be a year. So I'll be Dr. Ward this time next (laughs) year. (laughs) Long time coming. Yeah. Um, I have a BA in English from Howard University. 
an MA in arts management from American University. Mm -hmm. And then my doctorate um, will be from the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, where I'm currently uh, residing in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I'm an illustrator, a visual artist, a printmaker, a art educator, um, and an art scholar. So those are basically the overall roles that I play mm -hmm. day to day besides being mom. Yeah. <laughs> so um, that's that in regards to that. I'm also the founder of Black Women of Print. Mm -hmm. It is a directory of Black women printmakers. Um, we are opening invitations up again next month. We have um, founding members, Delita Martin, Jen Hewitt, Jennifer um, Mac Watkins. We also have Angela Pilgrim, Stephanie Santana, myself, and Leslie Dugut. And I'm hoping I'm not missing <laughs> anyone else. And Latoya Hobbs. There I we cannot, go. Um, get her. So those are the founding members. And Leslie Dugut came on after the founding member. So she's our first person in um, the first cohort. So we just kind of feel like she's mm -hmm. a founding member as well. Beauty. We Beauty. Love <laughs> um, you touched on that you're getting your, your PhD and that you just finished your coursework. And so you're doing your research and you think it's just going to be another year? Yes. Yeah, so yeah. I've, completed, I've completed chapters one through three. Mm. Um, and there's only five chapters okay. um, for the dissertation. So I completed 133 pages. I'm in the revision uh, phase of that now. So I'm revising that. And I'm hoping to have my um, hearing, my dissertation proposal hearing in August. Okay. And then they'll say, okay, you know, you can finish the research. So then I'll start doing qualitative interviews mm -hmm. uh, for a few months and basically coding that work and writing it. I'm writing those last two chapters. Pretty much a lot of it done. Yeah. <laughs> Already, yeah. Congrats. So yeah. That's huge. Thank um, you. And so does the PhD have anything sort of specifically to do with printmaking or is it, does it have play a part in it or is it more about the other side of your research? So basically it's two prongs. So for printmaking, I got into, I was at Pyramid Atlantic in Silver Spring, Maryland at the time. Now it's in Hyattsville, mm -hmm. Maryland. So when I was in graduate school in D.C., I interned there um, in development. Okay. And I started being a part of their screen printing society. So I learned about screen printing and paper making. And they're like very influential paper making and just paper arts and book arts organization um, within the U.S. So it was a wonderful introduction to printmaking for me. Mm -hmm. So after grad school, I actually did not do anything concerning printmaking at all. I was just doing my paintings and research and education. And about my second year into my doctoral program, I took print and near to form course hmm. in advance. And I kind of like really fell head <sighs> over heels again with printmaking. Good. It was just like bad. I just went down the rabbit hole with it. <laughs> <laughs> and I learned how to use the Vandercook, the a letterpress machine, and to typeset and to create book arts. And I screen printed some more. I got back into relief printing because I learned that a long time ago, like when I was in middle school, because I went to an art school for middle school. Yeah, yeah. It was just like more hands-on. And as far as the doctoral uh, program goes, I'm actually 10 credits away from having an MFA in printmaking. Okay. So the idea is for after I finish the dissertation to take a year and finish the studio art portion in like one course so that I can have the MFA in printmaking because why not, you know, 10 credits right, after absolutely. all the work that I've done. Yeah. So, so yeah, it does, my dissertation does have something to do with printmaking because I'm talking about black women in the arts. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I will be speaking with a few printmakers, but also artists and curators and collectors, et cetera, to gain knowledge about what does it mean basically to be a black woman within the arts in the U.S. Yeah. And how we are basically shaping spaces. That's really exciting. I want to definitely dive into that a little bit more. Okay. But before I get to that, I'd love to have a little bit more background about you and sort of growing up and what role art played? You said you went to an art middle school, which sounds amazing. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously yeah. it's been a part of you for since oh, you were yeah. a kid. I've been an artist all my life, I would say. My mother is an artist mm -hmm. and she drew me before, like she was doodling and she drew me as a flower. <sighs> and it was 
just like such personification basically <laughs> to have like a flower for a head and then the rest you know for a body but she was just doodling and because she has four daughters she decided that she didn't think that she could be an artist because she wanted mm-hmm. to be responsible for and take care of her children so she put down the dreams of becoming an artist to be a nurse Mm. so it's like that I get to live my mother's wildest dreams Mm. because of the sacrifices that she's made for me I went to an African-American immersion school and for elementary and with that I like learned Swahili and learned about Afrocentric culture I learned about performance art and theater and the arts so I had that black artistic cultural production very yeah. very early on um, just for my mother and then that atmosphere and then I went into middle school which was um, Lincoln Center Creative Middle School of the Creative Arts and that's where I really found out about showing your working galleries because mm-hmm. we had a gallery in our school that's so cool um, I took various courses with music I played the clarinet um, I was in swing choir like mm-hmm. basically I theater. I wrote plays. I was in forensics. Um, All of that growing up in middle school. And then I went to high school where I wrote plays and did theater and also did painting and drawing. So it's just been my entire life. You know, (laughs) that's so great. I know when you just kind of said forensics, it's probably not what most people think of when they hear the word forensic. Yeah. It's not CSI, <laughs> right? It's, it's. Oh, yes. I was not doing any CSI <laughs> as a kid. That would have probably weirded my mother out yeah. totally. But um, it's speech. Right. So it's like um, a performance art speech. I did poetry. I was in the poetry category mm-hmm. and also playwriting. So um, I wrote a play and it, I actually won a competition where I was in NAACP AXO so I got a chance to go to New Orleans because of my Mm. play um, for that so I just like always either have been a writer um, a conceptual thinker um, creating conceptual art as well as figurative art so just from go you were a maker I didn't play with toys my mother (laughs) um, she would buy me these wooden sets uh, when you open up, it's like a, a case and it had all like the oil pastels and everything. Or she'll buy me everything for like nail art. In it. Mm-hmm. So I, I was always just doing something artistic. Didn't want to play with the other kids. Um, <laughs> cried when she wanted me to go to the YMCA with yeah. the other children or the boys and girls club. And I'm just like, no, I just want to stay home, read my books <laughs> and paint or draw. Like, Gotcha. And so the, then that's when you were like, I need to get a PhD because that's... <laughs> That's what getting a PhD is. <laughs> I need to stay home yeah. and play with your books. Basically. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Basically, I, my mother probably trained me into the PhD because I was not going to get the um, doctorate at all mm-hmm. after my master's program. I said, I don't ever want to do school again. Right, this is right, like right. so much work. It's so intense. She said, no, you should do it. She mm-hmm. said, I know my child. You should do it. I'm just like, mom, do you really know me? <laughs> She's like, yeah apply and then I loved it you know I just yeah. absolutely love every part of it it's not to say that it's not hard like of course yeah if you're gonna get your doctorate they're gonna make you work for it mm-hmm. that's all <laughs> yeah so, yeah so yeah so then kind of going back to what you're working on now black women in America in the arts is a huge mm-hmm. topic right but maybe to kind of like zoom in a little bit on it and sort of talk about specifically <laughs> printmaking and then work our way into talking about um, what you're doing with black women of print I was thinking about like like where do, like where do we even start with all of that but one of the things that sort of struck me about it is obviously just like representation in education oh, and yeah. the need mm-hmm. for that is huge and that education beyond Elizabeth Catlett right? When people are creating the canon, it's, I feel like they feel like they've checked the box, right? They're like, well, we, we, we've yeah. got one. We have Elizabeth Catlett. Yeah. Like, okay, mm-hmm. you know, moving on. Like, yeah. <laughs> more yeah. dead white guys, please, you know? Um, <laughs> so I think maybe just like to begin kind of like a little bit historically, if you were rewriting like the printmaking section of an art history book or something like which um historical black women of print would you like to see like added in the canon so during women's history month each day i selected someone from i went from past to present to future for Mm -hmm. black women of print just so that people can have at least 31 people or 30 (laughs) women that you can begin to start understanding um the lives of 
if you can just have just a little peek into the fact that these are just 31 women that you did not know about or 30 women that you had no clue about. It's for Elizabeth Catholic because I had to, you know, have her because she is like the godmother for right. most of us mm -hmm. in printmaking because if we're talking about textbooks, that's how we learned about, you know, the black women who were in print, um, specifically Elizabeth Catholic. So she was our entry point for, for many black women. Mm -hmm. And then we had to go and do the research on our own, right. you know, and then still some black women don't know as far as the reach goes for um, printmakers. I would definitely give credit where it's due. Yeah, Elizabeth Catlett definitely belongs in the canon, but so does Charlotte Ruth Ellis. She actually owned her own business for letterpress. This is a black woman who had her own business mm -hmm. in Michigan for letterpress, and she was amazing. She was also an activist um, for, for gay rights at mm -hmm. a very, very early age where you know, she could have been in so much harm for being, you know, a black woman as well as a gay black woman yeah. and a gay black woman in printmaking. Yeah. So she deserves, you know, a lot of respect for breaking so many barriers um, in itself. And then Samella Lewis, like she, Dr. Samella Lewis, I should <laughs> say. <laughs> for me, she's the blueprint because okay. she wasn't, she's still alive. She's an art educator and she's still practicing. Mm -hmm. She's a printmaker. She's an art educator. She also raised money to start a book, an art book publishing company. It mm -hmm. was the first of its kind in the U.S. And a black woman started that so that she can get black artists out there because they weren't being in textbooks. So she had to do this herself and then sell these books. And she also worked with uh, another printmaker um, which was a woman, uh, to to help her with a lot of the work as well. So those, Faith Rangel, she is a printmaker, and she also wrote the infamous Tar Beach. And if you've ever read that as a child, you know that. So she's a collage, mm -hmm. illustrator, printmaker. She does it all, you know, as well. Then we have so many other, Camille Billups. She just mm -hmm. actually passed away. Um, she's a filmmaker, uh, she also did so much archiving for Blacks as a culture in general. And then she promoted Black uh, women a lot because she knew that the representation was just not there and it was supposed to be. So there are a lot of Black women that I can go on right, and right. on about historically, but this is just like foundational Black women within mm -hmm. the arts and specifically printmaking who also were powerhouses in other fields. Mm -hmm. So I remember you posting um, a photo on the Instagram, and I think now I should just plug the Black Woman of Print Instagram. It's incredible. It's like every single day there's something else on there that it's I'm just like, how did I not know about this? Oh, right. Societal hierarchies <laughs> that are entrenched for thousands of years. Right. That's why I didn't know about that. But it's just, you know, every time I see it, I'm just like, this is incredible. So absolutely. But yeah, I remember when you when you posted a photo of Charlotte Ruth Ellis, yeah, thank you, of, um, you know, standing in front of this printing press, and it's just great photos and incredible art, so definitely I'll put a link to that. I would maybe... Actually, it's Ruth Charlotte Ellis, I'm sorry. Ruth Charlotte Ellis. <laughs> I her... Yeah, I put her first name first, yeah. <laughs> no worries, no worries. I'm... Um... I'm a very bad art historian because I'm very bad with names, unfortunately, which is like, sometimes I think that's like, Miranda, that's just kind of like your job as an art historian is to know names. So no, it's a lot, especially when you have um, three names or whatever, or if you get into like Margaret T.G. Burroughs, you know, mm -hmm. like that's another uh, famous printmaker who was best friends and roomies with Elizabeth Catlett. Mm -hmm. And she doesn't even get yeah. as much um, as she should and she started cultural organizations for blacks so maybe it'd be a great time just to talk about the beginning of black women of print and when you started it how you started it okay so black women of print started just as an idea after reading different books and coming across <laughs> the fact that <laughs> they're basically the books were just saying oh these these are two women who are black and mm -hmm. they're printmakers that end you know <laughs> moving right. along I knew better. I said, well, this is not the history. You know, this yeah. is just a small, small part of it. So I said, I want to have a continuum of black women printmakers so that we can continue the legacy mm -hmm. and to bring 
all the women who are now hidden figures because you're not talking about them to the forefront and then also say, well, these are presently women who are still working within the field of printmaking so that they will not become hidden figures because we want to erase and dismantle all those things. And we cannot leave it up to anyone else besides ourselves. Like we have to do it for ourselves. So I had talked to Delita Martin and um, she's kind of like, my Elizabeth Catlett, I say that, you know, I said it in studio mm-hmm. um, noise podcasts. But when you find a mentor and they're so given and supportive with knowledge, you kind of gravitate, you know, towards that. So I talked to her and I was just like, you know, I would like to start Black Women of Print and uh, I would like to have you join. And she said, yes, whatever mm-hmm. um, you all need, this would be wonderful. So then I sent out a couple more emails to women that I knew who were um, printmakers. And when I say women that I knew, I did not personally know them. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I didn't personally know anyone. This was just uh, women that I had seen works by, basically. And I sent out an email for an invitation, being very transparent as to what this directory would look like, what it would be, and the room for growth and how I like all of our ideas to be enmeshed, you know, at one point within it. And everyone that I asked said yes, which Mm -hmm. was, you know, huge for me. So I knew I was on to something. And then after that, we just started talking like organically and trying to figure out exactly what we wanted it to look like. That's when we just started talking about like, you know, I told them about the portfolio because we had to think about sustainability. Now we're just in the phase where I'm doing some background foundational work so that Black Women of Print is around forever that's the goal I want so I want to pick up and leave where I left off up when I'm gone Mm -hmm. so that's basically where we're at right now doing our portfolios I'm building it up and so into a nonprofit organization so that we can have programming and events to help Mm -hmm. other black women printmakers have um, funding for startups etc because that's the only way it's going to actually continue as you know printmaking It's very, very expensive. Like the equipment is super expensive. So access, I think, keeps a lot of black women and black people in general or marginalized groups away from the field of printmaking because you're either learning at a university, which is not cheap. (laughs) It's not cheap to attend a university. Or you have to pay a co-op fee or something else monthly to use studio space. So we have to get to the elitism of printmaking as well, because it's supposed to be such a common commoners field, basically. Mm -hmm. But when you really look at it, it's very elitist in itself as well, because Mm -hmm. not everyone has access to thousand dollar equipment to do that and then i know some people will say oh well all you really need if you're doing relief is a lino cut block something to cut with and a spoon a wooden spoon okay but that means that this person can never expand the concepts that they have in their mind outside of relief through intaglio or screen printing etc so you have to think about all those because it's a privileged statement to say that as well totally totally yeah and and you have to ask yourself you know i mean how many how many works are being shown in museums or commercial galleries that somebody made in a kitchen with a lino cut block and a spoon. So I think it's like, it's kind of like, it is kind of, yeah, it's a little insulting to to say that because it's just like, you know, if you want to be a little, like make your little prints, like what's the problem, you know? It's like, no, they're bigger ideas for sure. And I think that's a really significant point is that, as you say, printmaking is pointed out to us like, oh, it's the democratic medium, it's the medium of the people and that sort of thing. But that's only in comparison to the extreme elitism as other art form. I would say every single person that I have had on this podcast and most every person I've ever talked to, you say, when did you fall in love with printmaking? And they all say at university. So at that Mm -hmm. point, you're cutting out a huge section of the American population right there. And my goal with Pine Copper Lime is like I wanted to have conversations with um, a diversity of printmakers from from different backgrounds, from different styles. Like the hardest, one of those goals I've tried to reach is to find Mm -hmm. printmakers who weren't university educated. Like I have Mm -hmm. found a printmaker who is quadriplegic, who I'm trying to get on the podcast before Mm -hmm. I found a printmaker who is not university educated, you know? So it's Mm -hmm. like, it's like that is such a huge 
barrier to get to get to printmaking. So. Exactly. Yeah, I don't think it gets discussed um, as much because it's very homogenous. So mm-hmm. to discuss something that's not a factor to most printmakers, it's like, why are we discussing this? We uh-huh. all feel the same in regards to this, or we all don't see it. Right. But when you begin to start thinking about calling a field, a field of the people, then you have to figure out what people. Right. And in that, once you break it down and deconstruct it, you're saying, okay, we're talking about university educated people who had the means to produce this sort of artwork. Mm -hmm. And that means that there are so many people who do not have the funds, but may have wonderful ideas who cannot enter into the space because there's a roadblock. It's there for a reason, I should say. So it's not Mm -hmm. like, oh, you know, it's no, there are always reasons to keep certain people from various fields. Mm -hmm. And when we start looking at that, then we have to say, if you really want a field to be of the people and to have equity there, then what are you going to do to provide the resources so that it's accessible? That's the only way the field is really going to grow to be even bigger than us. I love to like maybe zoom in a little bit and talk about like when you're talking about the specific roadblocks. Would you say more about that just so I'm not assuming and so everyone knows sort of what you mean by that? Yeah. (laughs) When we talk about the field of printmaking, we can just go super basic first. Mm -hmm. We can talk about instruction. Okay. So instruction will come from someone who's probably a master printmaker. Okay. And in order to be a master printmaker, you have to have years of technical experience, which comes with a lot of apprenticeships as well. So that's a lot of time where some people can afford not to work full-time jobs and take care of family and everything else to get to the master printer status. Okay. So we have that aspect right there. Then we also have geographical location. So let's think about the accessibility um, for that. Are there any centers that are free that people have access to where they can take public transportation or they can walk to to get this instruction. Okay. So, you know, there's another roadblock. We have instruction. We have um, access geographically via location for that as well. And then we go into the equipment. The cost of running a print shop is very expensive. The supplies, Mm -hmm. all of that. Who can afford a $10,000 printing press? Most of the times, yes, universities can yeah. can do that or people who have um, patrons who have um, done the development work. And most of the time when someone has a print shop that has educational programming, that's free. They're getting grants for that, but they've also raised or Matt had something matched for a million dollars or something. Yeah. So who is owning the print shop? Yeah. Okay. So we continue to see different roadblocks the more we deconstruct the field of printmaking. I guess then kind of my next question is, how do we go about removing those roadblocks? I believe that in order to have equity within the field of printmaking, first, we have to acknowledge all those different roadblocks, first and foremost. And we want to have more master printers, more advanced printers, um, more beginner printers who are not homogenous. And Mm -hmm. I say that in regards to ethnicity, gender, sexuality, um, education level, social economic income. We have to think about all of that because yeah. if we're talking about the people, then we also have to think about social construction because that's how society you know, is built. So you're going to have to think about all that. You cannot extract the body and the social constructs from a field because that field is indicative of to its surroundings. Okay. So I believe that in order for us to have equity within printmaking, that we're going to have to have some sort of funding set up that's going to have master printmakers pay them. Don't have them working for free. Yeah. <laughs> First of all, <laughs> pay them to start having some free courses to teach you know, outside of the academy. Okay. Mm-hmm to go into the community. Maybe there should be more community printmaking workshops that are pop-ups. You can do that. Or to have them just stationary in spaces where if someone does not have access to public transportation or a car, that they can walk there, you know, Mm -hmm. to do that. Some after-school programs would be also helpful um, so that people can come in after work because 
a lot of people have to work so they can eat and they can live and they can provide for their family. So they can't do apprenticeships and things, but Mm -hmm. they can sometimes get a babysitter and come in the evenings or on the weekends, maybe reduce fees um, so that some people can pay for those, you know, grants that's allowing people to do those too. So it's a lot of different things that um, we can do. And if you don't have access to the financials, then if you are very passionate about what you're doing, then why not provide your skills for free to right. the next generation? Not all the time, but you know, one person that you pour into can become a master credit maker who may be able to pour into more people. Mm-hmm. So those are just a couple ideas that I have about it. It yeah. doesn't solve the world. It's not going to make <laughs> printmaking <laughs> like a utopian feel, yeah. but you know, yeah. it's a start. No, I think that's huge and doable and something that is going to benefit everyone, right? And Mm -hmm. and particularly, I think about it in terms of like, let's say, you know, someone has just graduated with their MFA and they haven't gotten any positions offered to them. Do you want teaching experience? Like, why don't you go host a workshop somewhere? I was thinking about people who are doing workshops where people are paying and let's say you have like a dozen students like maybe have a couple of spots that are sort of scholarships that people don't have to pay for because you know it's not you're still going to have enough money to keep going obviously as you said it comes down to money not everyone can always provide free workshops all the time but just even giving a chance it's it's something that people should really be thinking about more in workshops versus paying like three credits for a course, you mm-hmm. know, at a university, I I absolutely believe you can get so much knowledge from university. But I also believe that not everyone has the ability to get funding or no one wants to take out loans or whatever right. else. There are just so many other roadblocks. So let's talk about the people who cannot do that. Um, it's okay to say, okay, well, I'm holding a workshop because there are so many like watercolorists and graph designers who just hold their own workshop mm-hmm. and say, okay, pay $40, you know, and we're meeting and doing this. Like, let's think about it in different ways. Like printmaking is a very, a very archaic, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, feel because, you know, we are working with these very old objects or whatever, but yeah. it does not mean that the people who are working with this equipment have to also be archaic. And, and I do think that printmakers pride themselves in being progressive, you know, and as you said, we, you know, that kind of like a democratic medium and accessible medium. Mm-hmm. And I think that we do identify that way. And we, we try to be socially aware and communicative. And I think that these are really great boots on the ground ways that we can put our money where our mouth is when it comes to yeah, exactly. how we self identify. Speaking of things and sustainability, You touched on it a little bit back there, but you talked about the portfolio that you're doing as a form of Mm -hmm. sustainability with Black Women of Print. I'd love to hear about sort of the creative and the logistical and financial sides of that, because I think it's a great model for supporting institution. It's mostly kind of like you'll see in different printmaking organizations, they'll have portfolio exchanges. Mm -hmm. So within the um, founding members, we... Um, this year, it'll be open to all members next year, but for our inaugural portfolio, each member will create 12 to 13 prints. It'll create a portfolio so that everyone who's in the founding members will each get a portfolio so they can keep. They cannot sell it, the portfolio right. whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> they cannot sell it unless they speak to you know the members and you know we decide together that that can happen, but... Mm-hmm. Uh, Basically, no, but you can pass it on to your estate. That's going to be like that every year that we do a portfolio because we don't want people joining and getting portfolios, no matter how big the artist may get over time right. and trying to sell the work because still it's a gift, you know, mm-hmm. it's a gift um, for the collective. So that's that. And then we'll have three other portfolios that'll be left. Um, one will go to organization um, or a collector it will be considered a restricted benefit. Mm -hmm. And what restricted means is that there will be restrictions for you accepting this donation. And that means that you have to make sure that it's exhibited ever so often will set the years. Mm -hmm. So in order for you to get that, you are agreeing to do do that. So that's uh, one of the things um, that we have for that. 
if it was unrestricted, that means here you go. Here's a donation. Um, if you decide that you want to sell it to mm. for years down the path and, you know, you can do that. There's no restrictions whatsoever if you need to sell it for operational costs or whatever right. else. OK, so, you know, there's restricted, unrestricted. So we have that. And then we have one that will sell and the proceeds from that will go um, for a stipend for a black woman printmaker so that she can attend a residency or for startup for printmaking. Mm -hmm. The other one that we will sell, it will go back to each of the members, um, whatever their print individual print costs within the portfolio. So what that does is it puts money back into the printmaker's pocket. Yeah. It gives um, a scholarship away for the next generation to start their funding or have a residency. Mm -hmm. And then the other one, it also um, helps generate a catalog or an exhibition or whatever else is needed basically for that collector or that organization showing the work by black women printmakers. So a continuum is happening with all three of those things. And then the archive, we have one that's just strictly right. going to be in the archive for black women to print. And so for anyone who's listening to this and thinking, oh my gosh, that is so smart. How do I learn about this kind of stuff? <laughs> like, like um, how would you recommend, like you said, you, you know, you had your, your MA with the focus in development. I mean, is that really the best way to learn the nuts and bolts? I can only tell you the way that it happened for me. And mm -hmm. I understand that that's also a privilege, but I didn't know any of this until I went to American University and had some of the absolute smartest <laughs> <laughs> professors that I have ever come into contact with when it comes to the business of art. Yeah. So I have an MA in arts management and specifically in development because I was interested in that. Mm -hmm. So that's how I found out about the inner workings of nonprofits and sustainability um, mm -hmm. for that. But as far as the business side of art, before I had an MA, I was already selling my work before that because I was always interested in entrepreneurship and marketing mm -hmm. and business because you can pick up books from that <laughs> for that yeah. you can, you know, do all of that. So there are two different things. I think it's harder for you to find out direct information for nonprofits. For profit is out there. Right. But for some reason, nonprofits it's just very tight knit as far as trying to get some information, mm -hmm. you know, about that. So I would say for me, it was school. It was yeah. the privilege of going to a university to learn about it. If you ever want to know the business behind how someone's doing in a nonprofit structure, you can look at their 1099 forms in the U.S. If you're a nonprofit, you have to have your annual report online so that it right. can be seen. So you can actually go through there. Um, that was one of the um, tricks that was taught to me uh -huh. at university is that before you go and work for a nonprofit, you go and you look um, <sighs> at that form to see if they're sustainable for like three or five years, how they're doing. Right. And if they're not doing great, then you don't accept that job because yeah. you may be out of one during that time frame. because a lot of nonprofits, they're closed in three, in three to five years mm -hmm. because they cannot sustain themselves. You know, you were talking about like, you know, finding um, a mentor. And I know that you'd mentioned that Delita Martin was definitely a mentor of yours. Mm -hmm. And I think that there are, probably are a lot of people in the arts and maybe even particularly people from marginalized groups that are like, I wish I had someone who was like me, who's been through mm -hmm. this that I could talk to. I guess I just kind of was hoping you could speak to the re that relationship forming and like, how yeah. do people do that? Because I think it is so so important um to the longevity and and life of someone in the arts i believe that you definitely need a mentor and a support group within the arts the way that um and let's just say delita has never officially said that she's going to be my mentor right right I, yeah <laughs> <laughs> i basically adopted her as you know my mentor because I saw her work. I loved what she did. I reached out to her. I talked to her and that could be the development side of me because I don't have a problem with asking. I've done asks before for money, lots of money. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> so asking, you know, someone for something, I think it's, you know, an exchange is way easier. Mm -hmm. um, so I think if you see someone that has said something to you or says something on a podcast that you like or something that you read, then reach out to them. You mm -hmm. don't know what you're going to get because we never know who a person is behind, you know, the magazine, behind right. the podcast, whatever. But you can ask, you know, mm -hmm. and and see if they're available. If not, then do they know someone who may fit 
on what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. And also your classmates, your peers, if you are in school, um, don't forget about them because, you know, cohorts become like families, you know, Mm -hmm. chosen families. So you can um, look at them as well. Or if you don't have anyone as far as in a school setting, then are there other artists that you like that you can talk to? And then you all can like group chat or whatever else. Form your own community at the same time. You all can learn from each other. And if you're stuck on a technique and you know that they have worked on it, just ask, you know, I'm trying this. I'm really I really want to get information about how to do this. I'm always asking, but I'm also always giving. And I think that that's a good segue into one of my other questions, which was, you know, when you were talking about Black women of print, you touched on this need for intergenerational knowledge and being able Mm -hmm. to to pass that down, um, Mm -hmm. which I'd love to hear you just speak about that a little bit. Within Black women of print, I decided to go with a model of intergenerational wisdom Mm -hmm. based upon the Sankofa principle. It's a very Afrocentric for me (laughs) with my lived experience and personal experience. That's all. Oh, it's a very African and Afrocentric centered philosophy. And that is to pass knowledge down from the elders on. In the U.S., it has become so youth centered that we look to the youth for everything because what's cool and everything else and ageism has taken center stage as well. Like, okay, they're old, you know, they don't really know what's going on in the now. When reality is, is that if we stay close to our elders and have that wisdom, then we can listen to that. We can remix it. We can figure things out for the future. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of um, the model that we have within Black Women of Print. We're always asking each other things, but also the women who are older ask the younger women about things. We can all teach each other something, you know, and and that's the beauty of it. The youngest person in the, our founding members is Angela Pilgrim. And she, I think she was born in like 1991 or 1993 mm-hmm. and like something like that. So there is like for me, I think there's like a 13 or 11 year difference, like, you know, in yeah. our age. But she does a lot of clever things like with social media or just has her personality, you know, out there a little bit more. And I love to see her do that. You know, I continue to say, you know, keep going, you know, you know, do this and do that. Cause I love to cheer her on. Yeah. But at the same time, she's very, very smart and she's an advanced um, screen printer. So you, I can ask her questions about that as well, where she can also ask me questions or I can ask Delita questions or Latoya Hobbs questions or mm-hmm. Jen, you know, we can just continue to ask one another questions to get better basically. That speaks to like one of the wonderful things about printmaking is that community kind of hearth in the print shop where you can look across the press at somebody and say, hey, like, what are you doing? How did you do that? And so I think printmakers are, are kind of naturally inclined to that. And then, you know, to set up a space that kind of is explicitly there to pass that intergenerational knowledge on um, is so important. I think that I really feel like I think everyone should get to the point where they're reaching back and looking and talking to their elders and that elders do the same thing to the youth. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, you know a lot. Yes, you do because you've lived a lot, but you haven't lived during this time to understand the technicalities of some things either. So um, the youth can also teach. It, mm-hmm. should all, it should be an exchange. So I'd love to know, I'd love to talk about your personal work a little bit uh, with the time we have left. Um, yeah, okay. And I know that, because uh, like I said, I've cheated a little bit and then I've already heard you on Studio Noise. So I know that <laughs> you've got a big project that's kind of secret <laughs> that you're not talking about. But anything so, you'd like to share with us, I would love to hear okay. it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I have this secret project, but <laughs> it's not so secret. Um, I've been doing studies. I'm thinking about a lot of things for about seven years, you know. Mm-hmm. And I've taken my time because it was a question. And with every question, you know, there's some sort of answer somewhere. So I've been searching for the answer by doing research, by drawing, creating studies, just like all those little things. So that's why I call it a seven year project. From all of that, Mm -hmm. I'm basically looking at (laughs) the most of stuff that I've written and drawn and picking out what's left, like the final things what I feel like is the answer for me I'm Mm -hmm. picking those things out and printing them 
and painting them um, in hopes of having an exhibition surrounding that in conjunction with the research writing that I've done. So it's just been a long process. I didn't want to share, you know, any of like my progress with it because I didn't want to be influenced in any way yeah. um, around the way that I was thinking mm -hmm. about it. I didn't want any pressure to put it out before I was ready for it. So I think there's a benefit in sharing different things that you create, um, which I do. I, I share. I'm just, Well, I'm trying to get better at sharing because I'm such a behind the scenes person <laughs> that it takes a lot of work for me. It's just very meta meta to photograph. <laughs> a print or, or or a painting and then to post it or whatever yeah. so I'm trying to get better that's like a flaw of mine because mm -hmm. I'm just so behind the scenes but if you stay so much behind the scenes you know people aren't going to be able to benefit from the yeah. work that you're doing yeah, yeah. so that's been a challenge for me to start to start doing that more mm -hmm. but yeah so I've been I'm working on all of that and I'm hoping that I can have the exhibition um, pop up when I do my dissertation okay. so that it can be hand in hand. So that's the goal. And um, if I do not reach that goal, it will come after the dissertation during the year that I'm doing the printmaking um, MFA. Okay. So either 2020 or 2021, all then right. you all will see uh, <laughs> what I've been up to. And hopefully, you know, it's as great as I feel yeah. uh, like it. At the end of the day, it answers the questions that I had. So it's done its job. That's a great way to go about making that I think particularly in the age of like the internet and Instagram and likes and follows we just we want that like tell me I'm good <laughs> you know yeah so behind the scenes in regards to that but I um think more so of practice it's when practice and theory work in tandem mm -hmm. so that's kind of what I've been doing trying to understand my praxis um as an artist and then so I think we've we've talked on this a bit but you know I always like to ask people what how are you particularly looking forward to in the next few years? Well, the reason why I went to get my doctorate in urban education is because I've always wanted to open up an art school. Mm -hmm. So um, that's my that's my big dream is to open up an art school. And there are different projects I'll be doing um, as I get to that goal. And it's basically to have a community of students that are um, coming up with this artistic cultural production that are under understanding all of these different practices. So yeah. um, that's the overall goal is to have is to have that art school and to have something that's accessible and all the things that I'm talking about in regards to equity. Peggy Kayfred, she has done a great job with Duke Ellington School out of D.C. So that's like a, a very big blueprint um, mm -hmm. for me as well for the art school that she's created. I just have like a lot of shoulders um, yeah. to stand on with, with some really, really awesome black women who, who have done a lot for the community. Mm -hmm. And I just want to be in that legacy to, to keep it going. And so, and so when you say art school, would it be kind of like what you attended where you, you go and you learn your reading, writing and arithmetic, but it's art and it's art centered though. Um, and it's, mm -hmm. it, art yeah, is always it, a part yeah. of it. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, so it'll be um, art centered, and it'll have the general education as well as being art centered. Um, and using a not-for-profit model, I assume, with your with your background and all that. Um, well, yeah, because in the U.S., it'll most likely be a charter school because that's the only way that you're able to get, you know, a school that you want to build from the ground up. Yeah. Unfortunately, I would love to see it, you know, in a public school structure. But right. the bureaucracy that I've seen from teaching in public schools is makes it a bit hard to mm -hmm. to do that although all of my art education has been through the public school mm -hmm. except for at university level so it's it makes me so sad to see what the public education system is now from what it used to be as mm -hmm. far as having the arts in there like now students don't have art at all or they'll right. have it like once or twice or something versus it versus it being just as important as general education. Do you think that like there's any chance of America moving back on that and like starting to to reintegrate? Oh, it? how like... I wish. <laughs> yeah, how I wish. I believe that it's imperative. Like it's vital that the US funds the arts because mm -hmm. we are creative people. And in order for us to go the distance, um, you have to let people imagine what's possible. Mm. I love that. And, you know, it kind of reminds me of a conversation I was having with my partner 
just a couple of days ago, you know, because we're, we're obviously, you know, we're not in the US anymore, but we both grew up there. Mm-hmm. And there's nothing like being removed from the water you're swimming in to be able to, you know, look mm-hmm. back at it. Mm-hmm. And particularly in this day and age, there's a lot to not be proud of about being an American. <laughs> you know? Yeah. When you're in Australia and, you know, people kind of are like <laughs> casually asking you to account for things that your commander in chief tweeted, <laughs> you know? Like, yeah. Yeah. About yeah, that. <laughs> yeah. I'm actually Canadian. Like, um, yeah. and I sort of say like in, in this day and age, because that's not to like, America has had a, a long history of doing horrible things, obviously, but you know, I I think that a lot of it is coming to the surface in a way that's really good. But it also means that it's like, you you have to deal with it, like you have, we have to process that and figure out what we're going to do. And so we were basically, it's a long way of saying that we were talking about, you know, what can we actually be proud of as Americans, right? Like, because that's a, a complicated question. One of the things that we kind of came up with was like, innovation. Yeah, I think, um, and it's always great. Uh, what I can say is um, since the Trump administration, what has been great for me is that I hear all of this talk about the embarrassment, you know, mm-hmm. but I think, not I think, I know for sure is that marginalized groups, and I'm going to specifically talk from a point of positionality um, as a black woman, as a mm-hmm. black person, is that we have always gone through this. Mm. So um, it was always looked upon as, is it really there? So we could feel something. We can feel the systemic oppression when other people could not see it. And now um, it's putting the vision and the feelings together. And now everyone is seeing it. So we've been living in this climate all along and innovating and everything else. So we were well equipped and prepared yeah. um, because we've done yeah. this in our entire lives. So I think now uh, it's important that everyone else sees how they have felt in these two years right. and then imagine someone being like this for centuries. Yeah. So if, yeah. You, if you can't handle it for two years, <laughs> no way have you, <laughs> you would have been able to handle it for centuries. So now's the time to say, okay, We don't want to do this anymore. You know, we don't want to do this anymore. Um, Let's backtrack and figure out how to get beyond this. Mm -hmm. And I think that's most important now. Now everyone sees and feels what other groups have felt for centuries. Let's find the equity now Mm -hmm. and and do better. That's that's pretty all all we can do. Instead of saying, "Uh I told you, you know, this was not just a feeling. So yeah, I think that. That's, and innovation has always been there, and I think it will always be there, but mm-hmm. it can be better if we invest in it, like we are investing in things that we don't need, right. <laughs> like a wall, but okay. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'm hoping that thinking about it is using the analogy of like, it's been like a poison that's been maybe a little bit underneath the skin, and we're just mm-hmm. squeezing it out. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And so it's always been there. And now that it's on the surface, it has a chance to be addressed. The secret's out. Basically, yeah. the secret's out. So. <laughs> <laughs> the secret's out. So, like, what can we do now to heal? Mm-hmm. People are now having conversations that could have been being had for centuries, but they're happening now. And um, yeah. Yeah. And you can take that back. So all you can do is just, you know, um, work with where we're at now and and go for it. So I just would maybe want to close up by asking you, where is the best place people can follow you? And I mentioned, of course, the Black Woman of Print Instagram, which is great. But for both that project um, and your, your personal work, where can they find you online? Yeah, so we are at Black Women of Print um, on Instagram. We are also www.blackwomenofprint.com. We have um, blog posts that are coming out. You can sign up for our newsletter where we'll have exclusive um, interviews and behind the scenes action from various Black Women printmakers who are a part of Black Women of Print and who's outside of um, the directory as well. Mm -hmm. So a lot of that's coming up. You can follow me at tkeyword.com. Um, that's where I'll have everything housed for me. I'm redoing my website right now. So um, everything will be housed there. And 
you can click on whatever you need to click on and find out the different sections, you know, about myself from being our culture journalist all the way up to some creative direction stuff that I've done to artwork and research, etc. Um, in regards to that. And then we have a lot of great things coming uh, with a shop for Black Women to Print is oh, going nice. to come. So we're going to have, yeah, so we're going to have some merch um, that's happening. And I have a lot of print work and publishing projects that I'm currently working on um, that I'm excited to introduce. So, yeah. Awesome. Well, <laughs> I definitely, yeah, I have to say, like, as soon as Black Women of Print kind of seem to like just explode into the print scene it just was so clear that it was the aesthetic the organization behind it it just was like it was so good oh thank you yeah it it was definitely inspiring for me look forward to following all of that and i hope we can have you on again maybe um sometime next year when your seven year print project is finally revealed kind of talk about where black women of print is at that point because i know this is pretty new right now and and all of that yeah it's definitely very very new right now so um, it would be great to talk to you um, after because you'll see a lot of the stuff that rolled out. Totally, totally. And the, <laughs> the portfolio and, and all of that. And yeah, so thank you. Oh yeah, you. I can't wait to show that. It's going to be a stunner. Oh, <laughs> I'm so excited. So thank you so much for, for all your, your wonderful you. words of wisdom and inspiration. So thank, thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah. You're going to, you're waking up and I'm going to bed. So. I know. Have a good day. <laughs> yeah, I've got my coffee. Well, that's our show for this week. Join me again in two weeks' time when my guest will be Elizabeth Jean Youngs. We talk about her time printing at Tandem and Gemini, being your own print boss lady, and that eternal question, what's a nice girl like you doing making a print like this? This episode, like all episodes, was written and produced by me, Miranda Metcalf, with editing help from Timothy Pauschak and music by Joshua Weber. I'll see you in two weeks. Thank you.